Hi, and thank you for joining us for today's Institute of Risk Management webinar. As I'm sure you're all aware, this is part of a series of webinars on risk management, all of which are free to access and listen to whenever you would like. My name is Dr. Sarah Gordon, and I will be leading you through this webinar today. I'm a trainer for the Institute of Risk Management here in London, designing and delivering a number of courses, three of which we will touch on today. I'm also one of the team of trainers who delivers the IRM's Fundamentals of Risk Management course, and over the past year, I've been really lucky to work with a wide range of industries and organizations across the world, such as mining companies in South America, manufacturing companies in China, tech startups in North America, banks in Africa, and charities, agricultural companies, insurers, and healthcare organizations here in the UK. The last slide in the accompanying slide deck that you have in front of you contains some more information on my background and also the risk management consultancy called Satala, of which I am a director. I'm accompanied here in the Institute of Risk Management by John Clay from the IRM, who is the resident technical genius, and I'm assured that if for some reason your sound or internet connection drops during this broadcast, please don't worry, as the full session will be available for your viewing as soon as this live version finishes. Now, as we progress through this webinar, please feel free to ask questions using the appropriate button in front of you. I will attempt to answer as many of them as possible as we progress through the session. However, any that we don't manage to get to during the session, I will answer directly by email once the webinar has finished. Please also feel free to send any questions or comments or suggestions directly to myself at the email address on this first slide, which is satala.com. Okay, so moving on to the agenda that we're gonna progress through over the next hour of this webinar. Um, we're going to go through three tools which are vital for any risk manager. And I'm sure that most of you have come across these tools before and indeed use them every day. However, what we're going to try to do is to give you some hints and tips on how to optimize these tools for your organization and therefore make them even more useful and practical. So firstly, we're going to go through what is a risk register um, and why do we use them. And we're going to focus in on the structure of your risk register. For example, what sort of categories you might like to include, what sort of things you need to have within that risk register to make it as useful as possible for your organization. Secondly, we're going to have a look at your risk ratings matrix. Um, and so this is the primary tool that you probably use to prioritize and rank your risks. Um, and to do this, we need to have an understanding of what likelihood and consequence means for your risks. We'll also look at how your risk ratings matrix can help you to induce action and decision making within your organization. And finally, we'll look at how your ratings matrix can be used as a reporting and communication tool. Finally, we're going to have a look at one of my favorite tools, uh, which is a risk bow tie. And we're going to look at how these can be used as both a facilitation and problem-solving tool. Um, we'll look at how you can expand them to help them uh, support your business case and also things like root cause analysis when you're looking at why an incident happened, for example, and how to prevent a repeat, perhaps, of that negative risk or that negative incident in the future. And finally, we'll use the bow tie to have a look at how to optimize your suite of controls that you might like to put in place to either enhance your risk if it's a positive risk or prevent that risk if it is a negative risk, along with any assurance, i.e. audits and reviews, that you might like to put in place. So that's our agenda. As I said, I will endeavor to get through this in less than an hour, um, so it's a nice bite-sized chunk for all of you. So, moving on to our first um, poll that we're going to use during this session. 
Now, given that much of the training that we run here in the Institute of Risk Management is learner-centric, that means that every course is slightly different as it's tailored to all of the participants that we have attending those courses. We're going to start by getting you guys to do all the work. And I'm going to ask you six very simple questions which will appear on your screen very shortly. Um, the first of which is, and we're just going to get that up now, is I am sorry, we're still trying to find it. I'm going to ask you um, how likely are you to use your risk register? And I'd like you to give me a vote, one being very rare, two being unlikely, three being fog possible, four being likely, and five being almost certain. Okay, so we're going to bring that up right now. So if you'd just like to vote for that. Excellent. So just looking at those results, that's 100% of you are saying that it's almost certain that you would use, sorry, it's almost 100% of you that are almost certain that you would be using a risk register within your organization, um, and 15% of you say that it's likely. If we move on to the second question now, um, and it's exactly the same question, but with regards to your risk ratings matrix. So how likely are you to you to use within your organization a risk ratings matrix, one being rare, two being unlikely, three being possible, four being likely, and five being almost certain. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that and have a look at the results. Okay, very similar results. So we've got 77% of you saying it's almost certain that you'd use one. Um, and the final question in that ways of questions is how likely is it that you would use a risk bow tie? Again, one being rare, two being unlikely, three being possible, four being likely, and five being almost certain. Let's have a look at those results. And yes, again, um, we've almost got 100% of you that say it is almost certain. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Okay. We're going to move on to the second half of our voting, um, and I'm going to ask you what do you feel the impact is of using your risk register? So exactly the same as before. One is insignificant, two is minor, three is moderate, four is high, and five would be a major impact. Okay, so what we've got here is quite interesting. Um, only 40% of you say that you'd have a major impact with your risk register, 44% of you say it's high, and 16% of you say it's moderate. Um, if we do the same for your risk ratings matrix, so what do you feel the impact is of using your risk ratings matrix within your organization? One, being insignificant, two, being minor, three, moderate, four, high, and five, major. Okay, and it's actually slightly lower um, than what we had for your risk register. Um, so we've got about 33% of you saying major, um, and the rest of you being between likely and possible, one or two of you being unlikely. Okay, um, and now if we go on to the final question, which is what do you feel the impact is of using a risk bow tie? One being insignificant, two being minor, three moderate, four high, and five major. And we'll have a look at that now. It's just coming through to us. Okay, excellent. And something similar. So the majority of you actually feel that a risk bow tie um, only has a moderate impact within your organization. Well, this is good news for me um, because what it means is that hopefully we can improve some of those impact scores as we progress through the next 50 minutes of this webinar. So thank you very much for all voting. Um, and we'll just get back to our main slide now. So 
If we move on to the first section of our webinar, which is looking at what is a risk register and why do we use them. Um, well, a risk register is your primary record of your organization's current risk knowledge. So this means that it is the central repository for risks across your organization. And it will include things like your understanding as to the causes and consequences of those risks. It will also include something along the lines of how important you feel each risk is to your organization. Um, and ideally, this importance should be based on data rather than just opinion. Um, and it might also include things like what sort of controls you might require to best manage those risks within your organization. Now, a risk register generally takes the form of a table um, or a spreadsheet or a database, and it's therefore designed to house lots of data and knowledge. And risks are generally allocated their own individual row, for example, within this table with lots of different categories or columns of information um, providing more in-depth information on those risks. Your risk register is not designed to be a report for your board of directors. Um, I've worked with lots of different companies um, and organizations where they have tried to give their risk register as a report to their board of directors, and the traction that they have had has been minimal, primarily because it's full of lots of information, and it's quite difficult to weed out where the important risks are or the important controls are or the important decisions are for that senior group of people within your organization to have to deal with. It is also very easy for a risk register to grow and grow until it becomes completely unmanageable. And unmanageable. I've seen risk registers that were so big that they couldn't be printed or saved easily. I've also seen registers that had so many columns and categories to fill in for each risk most of which did not really seem to be relevant at all to your organization, that you lost the will to live before you got halfway through completing them. So, with all of this in mind, it is therefore key to keep your risk register as simple as possible and to tailor it to your organization. You really need to think carefully about what information you need in this risk register and what might just be superfluous to your needs. People within your organization are far more likely to complete their section of the risk register or give you the information if you are that risk register controller if you keep the information you need from them to a minimum. If you do this, your risk register is far likely to be up to date and therefore useful to decision makers. It can also be used to highlight which are the threats and opportunities with the highest priorities and therefore require the most attention from all those busy people in your organization. Now, there are loads of fantastic softwares out there that you can use to be your risk register. However, for the purposes of this webinar, I'd like you to imagine a basic Excel spreadsheet, as to be honest, that is what most risk registers are at heart. So, if we move on to the structure of your risk register, what we mean here is all of those different columns within your spreadsheet. You want to design your register so that you get the right intent and content of these columns, and it's really important to make sure that it is tailored to your organization. To ensure that you get the right structure, you can use something like the ISO 31000 process, which I'm sure most of you have come across before, and it is reproduced here in the middle of the slide. This provides a good starting point for the structure of your risk register, as it guides you simply through the different steps of risk management, and includes the information for which you might choose to house within your risk register. You might therefore like to check that your risk register includes some sort of ability to say what the context is for your risk, information on the risk identification, including a description and perhaps an evaluation of how important your risk is. You might also like to include what sort of treatments you have or may like to have in place, 
and potentially some sort of ability to monitor the status of your risk. It is really important to align the structure of your risk register to the structure of your organization. And this just means that if you have lots of different departments or businesses within your organization, you might need to establish some sort of coding system for each department or method by which you can very quickly see if a risk is unique to just one area or impacts on many projects across your organization. To work out the structure of your organization, if it is not very clear, which is actually the case in many different companies, there are a number of questions you can ask yourself or those people around about you. And they include, what is the structure or shape of your organization? Is it very centralized, perhaps like a triangle? Or is it decentralized, perhaps a bit like a starfish? If this is the case, then you might need to have a slightly different coding structure. You might also need to think about including external as well as internal stakeholders or risk owners when working on your risk register. And if so, you'll need to work out how do you include them and identify them within this coding structure. And ultimately, you need to work out how detailed do you need to be, i.e. how deep in the organization do you need to go in order to get your risk information. Many organizations have lots of sub-risk registers and sub-sub-risk registers, um, and this is completely fine, as it means that each department, business, team, project, etc., can own their own risk register. However, if you are the enterprise risk manager or the central risk manager within your organization, it could be your job to try and collate all of that information together. And to do this, it is often really useful for each department or team to be using the same kind of risk template. So you can simply copy and paste between all of those different templates. So, having got your organizational structure sorted and reflected to the correct level of detail within your risk register, you then need to start identifying your risks. Now, there are loads of ways of doing this. However, a really good starting point is by looking at the objectives set by your organization. This is important because a risk is not a risk unless it affects your objectives for your organization. So what you can do is using your list of organizational objectives, work through each one and brainstorm what could be the risks associated with each objective remembering that risks can be both positive and negative. Another useful tool that you can use to help identify risks associated with your objectives and business as a whole is the extended enterprise mapping technique, a version of which is seen on the bottom left-hand corner of this slide. Now, this technique takes four simple steps to complete, and it's a really simple way of ensuring that if you are running this as a risk workshop or you're facilitating a lot of people, if you do the extended enterprise mapping technique, everybody in the room will understand your business from the same point of view. So, firstly, ask the people in your organization or workshop to write down what they think your core business is. Please note that you can reduce the scope of this exercise to a single project or a team, depending on what is necessary for your needs. Write these right in the middle of that box that says core business. Secondly, ask everybody in the room to write down all of the inputs that they might need to carry out that core business. And these could be everything from electricity to skilled individuals to raw products to come into your core business, etc. Next, ask them what the outputs of your core business are both in terms of positive outputs, such as products, cash, and happy customers, and negative, ne negative outputs, such as waste. These three components form a very, very basic value chain um, and is that core flow throughout your business and your company. The final thing that you need to do is write down all of the external factors which may impact on this value chain. 
these might be things that you, you might not be able to really control. Um, however, they will seriously impact on your ability to carry out that value chain. Each of the components and links in this simple picture can give rise to risks, but it also ensures, ensures that those taking part in your risk workshop or your exercise are all on the same page as to the scope of the risk work that you are carrying out and the objectives which you are interested in. Other risk identification techniques that you can use are things like PESL, which you see here on the right-hand side of the screen, and PESL just stands for Political, Economic, Social, Technical, Legal and Environmental Risks. Or you can use the Institute of Risk Management wheel pictured on the bottom right-hand corner. These are just memory prompts to help you consider your risks or your organization's objectives through different lenses. Now, when I was describing these techniques, I kept mentioning other people. And this is because um, often you come across an organization and there's the poor risk manager who is chained to a desk in a broom cupboard with no windows, surrounded by a risk register which will never be complete, let alone up to date or used by anyone. The only reason they're doing it is because they need to pass an audit. Now, you can be the most intelligent risk manager in the world but you'll never be able to identify all of the risks to your organization without getting the people in your organization to work with you. Therefore, by facilitating risk identification workshops with different departments and teams, you can explore and identify risks across your organization, all of which you can then list and record within your risk register. So now that we've identified lots of different risks. We now need to be able to describe them properly. And risk description is an art within itself. And we go into this in a lot more detail on some of our courses, such as our risk register course and our risk assessment course. A really simple way of describing a risk is to talk about it as a story or in three component parts. Firstly, starting with the source or the causes of a particular risk. Then you might talk about the risk itself, which is the uncertain event, which may or may not happen. And if it does, it will impact on the objectives of your organization, and it can be positive and or negative. And then thirdly, you want to talk about the impacts or the consequences of your risk, should it occur. Now, often, when we're trying to sell the importance of managing a particular risk, be it a threat or an opportunity, to a superior or the rest of our teams, we will start with the impact of that risk, should it occur. As, to be honest, this immediately tells them why they should care and therefore why they should listen to you. We then tend to naturally work backwards to the causes, as the causes are the things that we might actually need their help to control. Because if we can control them, we're more likely to be able to manage the risk most effectively. This is often an iterative process with our understanding of our risk improving as we gain more knowledge. And there are loads of different ways in which we can capture this knowledge, data and information before recording it within our risk register. One tool that we can use to do this is a really simple risk bow tie. And you can see a very simple example of this in the bottom half of your screen now. So with time running from left to right, we see the causes on the left feeding into the risk in the central and then resulting in a suite of consequences or impacts on the right-hand side. Now, I will save the beauty and intricacies of the bow tie for later in this webinar rather than spoiling it now. So what we've managed to do is we've managed to identify a lot of our risks within the context of our organization. We've managed to describe them, um, complete with all of their causes and their consequences. And what we tend to find is, especially if we've done this at an enterprise-wide level, is that these risks will vary hugely in nature. We probably have financial risks, health and safety risks, reputation risks, etc. 
Um, and they're probably owned by a whole array of different people across our organization. So how on earth do we compare them and begin to work out which are the really important ones that we need to pay most attention to? Now, the most commonly used technique um, is a risk ratings matrix, and I'll come into this in more detail um, in about 10 minutes' time. But to, to summarize it, a simple risk ratings matrix takes into account the likelihood of a risk occurring, um, and should it occur, what the level of consequence or impact might be. Now, many of your organizations, as we saw in that initial voting that we did at the beginning of this webinar, um, will have a form of risk matrix. Um, some will be three by three, some will be five by five, some will be 99 by 99. It is completely up to you how complex you want to make your risk matrix. However, the most common is a five by five category risk matrix or a six by six. Now, on this risk matrix, you can plot a number of things um, or a number of risk ratings. The first is the gross or inherent risk rating. And this refers to a risk where the, likely and the likelihood and consequence of the risk, um, what it would be if there are no controls in place or you had no management of this risk whatsoever. Often this tends to be high if the risk is negative, so you might be plotting that risk somewhere in the red area of your risk matrix, um, or it might be relatively low potentially if your risk is positive, i.e. it's an opportunity that you would then want to increase the likelihood of it occurring. The second rating that people quite often plot in their risk ratings matrix um, is the current risk rating or the residual risk rating. Now, this is the rating for your risk with the current effectiveness of controls in place. So, if you have a list of wonderful controls, but none of them have actually been implemented, then their effectiveness will be zero, and therefore your current risk rating will be exactly the same as your gross risk rating. However, if you have managed to implement some of those lovely controls, your current risk rating should hopefully be slightly different from your original gross risk rating, as you will be managing that risk a little bit better. The third risk rating um, that you quite often see being um, plotted on a risk ratings matrix and therefore recorded in a risk register is the target risk rating. Now, this target risk rating is the level to which you would like to manage that risk or control it to. This level is generally determined by your organization's appetite and tolerance to risk. Um, and this is a topic which we unfortunately don't have time to go into on this particular webinar, um, but we do so in the risk, um, risk matrix training course that we run here within the Institute of Risk Management. Now, your organization's appetite and tolerance is quite a difficult topic to get your head around but it's crucial if you want to be a mature organization with regards to managing your risks and taking advantage of them where possible. Many risk registers will have space for all three of these different ratings. However, you might decide that your organization only wants to use the current risk rating, for example, and this is completely fine as it simplifies your risk register by far. It also provides a prioritized list of what needs to be managed now, and so therefore provides a really simple ranking tool that you can use to bring those really high, big and scary risks, if they're negative, or big opportunities, if they're positive risks, to the top of your risk register. So, having prioritized your risks using something like a risk ratings matrix, you might now need to record an aspect of how you're going to treat those risks. Many risk registers only get as far as risk identification, description, and ranking. However, the most useful risk registers also include an aspect of action management. Now, many organizations have dedicated action management systems or a version of a to-do list, and these are fantastic provided you link your risk register into your action management system. 
If you don't have an action management system in place within your organization, you, consider, you could consider using your risk register as the basis for it. And this would be a really nice way of making sure that your risk register is looked at and reviewed on a really regular basis and therefore keeps your risk register live and full of up-to-date information. Now, lots of tools can be used to ascertain which controls you might need to implement to better manage a risk. Lots of health and safety professionals make use of the hierarchy of controls, um, which you can see here on the left-hand side of your slide. Um, while more financial-based disciplines might prefer to use the four T's seen here on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, both models um, show elimination or termination as a type of control, and these refer to purely to the removal of the cause of the risk or the risk itself entirely. These are obviously the most effective type of control. However, it is often um, not appropriate to do this, as you need to take risks to make your business work. Slightly weaker controls, such as substitution, isolation, or treat, for example, will be less effective, but more effective than just tolerating the risk. The final thing to make sure you have within your risk register when you're listing your controls is to ensure that each control has an owner, as should every risk, of course, as this will increase the likelihood of that control actually being implemented and managed and then monitored continuously. So we've got all of our controls in place. The final few things that you may want to consider having within your risk register, um, as I say, many risk registers do not have this, and that is completely fine. Um, however, having these next two items within your risk register will just make it that little bit more robust, is uh, firstly a log of how you're going to monitor the status of your key risks and controls. Um, and it can be done through two main methods. Um, the first is through assurance, be it internal or external, and the second is through something like key risk indicators. So on the assurance side, your, your internal auditors, if you have them within your organization, and many organizations do not have internal auditors, but if you do have them, they will only have so much capacity. Now, if you work with them as the risk manager and use your risk register, you can identify key risks or controls which you might like them to go and have, an, have a look at, be it through an audit or review. Now, the debate of whether risk and assurance should be in the same department or separate departments plagues many companies, as both have a lot to offer one another. Um, but the ultimate thing is that you need to be speaking to one another and you're sharing information in a really clear format. And if you're clever, you can use your risk register to be just that. The second way of monitoring and reviewing your risks and controls is through using something like a key risk indicator. Now, key risk indicators, as it says in COSO 2010, um, key risk indicators are simply metrics used by organizations to provide an early signal of increasing risk exposures in various areas of the enterprise. There are many different forms of key risk indicators, and um, we could dive into a lot of detail on these, which unfortunately we don't have time for now. Um, but they're given many different names. You can come across uh, key risk indicators being called leading indicators, trigger points, uncertainty monitors, predictive measures, key control indicators, etc. The list goes on, and they could all be considered to be key risk indicators. If you want your risk register to be as live as possible and to become that early warning tool um, if a risk is increasing or decreasing and likelihood of occurring, then you might consider having some key risk indicator information included within the register. However, as I said at the beginning, only the most advanced risk registers are likely to have this. So, to summarize our risk registers, which is, of course, the first of the three tools that we're looking at in our toolbox webinar today, by using our ISO 31000 process, we've whizzed through the primary categories, 
that you're more, most likely to require in your risk register. And they include some sort of unique identifier or alignment with your organization structure. Then we had a description of each risk within your organization, including the causes and consequences of that risk. Then we had a look at rating your risks or ranking them, be it by using the gross, current, or target risk rating within your risk matrix. It doesn't matter which one you want to use, if in fact you want to use all three of them, but you need to have some method of prioritizing your risks and so therefore focusing in on the really important ones. Then we had a look at including a section for risk treatment or action management within your risk register. And finally, we had a look at considering a section for monitoring and review, be it through auditing or assurance or using something like key risk indicators to keep a very regular monitor on how your risks may be changing. So to summarize in total, risk registers record all of your risk and control knowledge together with your appetite to manage those risks and the status of your controls. For your risk register to be truly optimal for your organization, it needs to be tailored to your organization. Otherwise, it runs the danger of becoming burdensome, burdensome and confusing, and so people just will not use it. It ideally needs to be updated as regularly as possible. Um, and this should be done either when a big change occurs within your organization or done on a predefined schedule. These are key to keeping your risk register live. Ideally, you need to link your risk register to separate action registers if you have them within your organization. Um, or you might like to use things like a higher level critical control register. Um, all of these things need to be aligned and updated when appropriate. If you want to include all that information within your central risk register, that is fine as well. And finally, you need constant communication and discussion regarding the status of risks and controls recorded in this risk register as it underpins the management of risks within your organization. So what we're gonna do now is move on to our risk ratings matrix and understand why do we use them. Um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier um, to talk about those different ratings and prioritizations that you might have within your risk register. But just to describe the risk ratings matrix in a bit more detail, we'll go into that now. So as I mentioned, the risk ratings matrix is the primary method used in many different companies for ranking and prioritizing your risks. They're commonly used across the board. The problem with a risk matrix comes when it is not tailored to your organization. And so therefore, people just seem to arbitrarily rate risks based on their own interpretations or, or to often ensure that those negative risks just sit below the threshold at which some action is required to do something about those risks. <laughs> so with this in mind, we're going to attempt another vote and I'm going to ask you a really arbitrary question with very little context, so that is, this is not good practice at all. And I'm going to ask you, what is the risk of rain? Now, I understand that many of you are in different countries around the world, in different time zones. I'm currently sitting here in the UK, where I would consider the risk of rain as being pretty high. Um, so we're going to start that voting right now risk of rain being fairly high in the UK. Um, so that vote should be with you right now. What is the likelihood of rain? A being rare, B being unlikely, C being possible, D being likely, and E being almost certain. Excellent, so we've got some of your votes coming in now. We'll have a look at those results. Okay, so we've got a complete spread across the board. Some of you are in a lovely part of the world, perhaps, where it says 8% of you say rare, 33% of you say possible, and the rest of you are either likely or almost certain. And I'm going to ask you what the consequences of it raining um, within your frame of reference. Uh, so we'll start that now. So A being insignificant, B being minor, C being moderate, D being high, and E being major. 
give you a few seconds for that to come through. Okay, let's leave it there and have a look at the results. Okay, yeah, so we've got another complete spread across the board, almost even between insignificant through to major. Now, so our results are all over the place. And this is absolutely no surprise at all, as I firstly asked you a really silly question um, with absolutely no context whatsoever. And I gave you no information on what I really meant by things like insignificant, minor, moderate, high, or major. So I suspect everybody on the call interpreted it in their own way using your own personal frame of reference and where you happen to be at the moment. Now, this is really difficult if we use that sort of risk matrix within your organization, as you want to focus people in on what your organization is, what the objectives are within your organization, and get people to understand risks in the same manner. So therefore, you need to design your risk matrix properly um, and really think about how to define those different categories within both likelihood and consequence. If you do this, then your risk matrix can be used as a re really robust form of communication, as well as prompting discussion and decision making within your organization. And this therefore allows risk-based action management to occur within your organization as a whole. So if we look at those different um, categories within both likelihood and consequence, um, firstly we'll focus in on likelihood on the left-hand side of your screen well, what do we mean by it, um, and how do we quantify it? Well, if we stick with our five by five matrix, um, we need to work out what we mean by categories such as rare, possible, almost certain, etc. And the best way to do this is to provide some form of units, such as time, or a ratio, or probability, for each of these different categories such as every 10 years being something that is rare, down to once every 24 hours if something's almost certain. Now, you need to vary this depending on what sort of organization you have. Um, for example, if you are a mining company, then an event that is rare might be more than every 30 years because it's a very long-scale type of organization. However, um, say you are part of the police force, then something happening less than, than that time scale is what you want to have as rare. So that is your likelihood. If we move across to the right-hand side of your screen and have a look at the consequence or impact categories, this is slightly more complex to get right. Now, most risks, as we saw when we were identifying them, using tools like the Institute of Risk Management wheel, for example, will have more than one type of consequence or impact. Um, the consequences could be financially orientated or something to do with your reputation, your production, safety, environmental, etc. Um, and each of these are really important. So what you want to do is work out what sort of consequences are things that impact on your organization's objectives and list them. Then you need to work out a scale for each of those consequences. And you do this by understanding what would have a major impact on your organization, which might be catastrophic, all the way down to what would only have an insignificant impact, i.e. you would notice it, but it wouldn't really be a big deal. For example, say you run a fairly large company, um, if you gained or lost more than a billion dollars in a year period, this might be more appropriate as the value in your major financial category rather than the 10 million that I have listed here in the example in front of you. So when you determine these consequence categories, remember that risks can be either positive or negative. So therefore, the 10 million loss or gain may refer to the, as I say, the loss or addition of this sum of money. Similarly, we might look at safety as being referring to lives that might be saved or lost. This allows you to plot both positive and negative on the same matrix, and you can do this by using an array of different colors, for example, for each of those risks. 
The final thing to mention um, in this particular slide is that each consequence type should not be equal to one another. So using the example in front of you now, um, where we've got one life lost being the equivalent of a high consequence, this is not equal to the loss or the gain of $1 million to $10 million, or 500 to 1,000 tweets, for example. Rather, for each consequence type scale, the lowest category needs to be the insignificant value for that type of consequence, and the highest should be the most major value. Now, moving on to our next slide, um, what we're going to have a look at now is I'm going to ask you another question about rainfall. Um, I'm going to give you this question with a bit more context, and using the values that you see in front of you, I'd like you to answer the questions just like before. So if we bring up our voting system again, I am going to ask you if we find it. So what is the likelihood of excess rainfall causing a disruption to the UK-hosted Rugby World Cup. And just to give you some more information about this, uh, the Rugby World Cup kicks off in one month's time. Most of the matches will be undertaken outdoors, so they will be subjected to rainfall within the UK. So what do you think the likelihood is of excess rainfall causing a disruption to the UK-hosted Rugby World Cup being, will it be rare, unlikely, possible, likely, or E, almost certain. Cool, so excellent, lots of you have voted, okay. And what we've got here is we've got a, most of you have voted that it is possible um, that rain will cause a disruption to the Rugby World Cup. Um, I think you're probably all <laughs> pretty much correct. Um, but yes, what we've got here is a much closer cluster of you guys identifying what the likelihood is of rainfall disrupting on the World Cup. We think that it might disrupt one match every month, um, looking at the likelihood scale. Um, we're now going to have a look at what is the impact if that rainfall does occur and disrupt a match. So if you could give uh, what you think the rating would be, A being insignificant, B being minor, C being moderate, D being high, and E being major. Give you a couple of seconds to finish that. Excellent. Have a look at that. Okay, so again, we've got a really tight cluster, and most of you feel that actually, if it rains during the Rugby World Cup, um, it will have a fairly minor consequence. Um, some of you have said it's moderate or high. You've probably got more information than the rest of us. Um, but what we see here is Relevant, um, relative to the first question I asked you, where we haven't gone through what I meant by the different categories within likelihood and consequence, our opinion and our results were all over the place. Where as soon as we provide a much tighter definition for each of those likelihood and consequence categories, it becomes much easier for us to plot a risk on our 5x5 five five risk matrix. Um, and as a result, we can give each of those risks the importance that they deserve. The final few things to talk through um, within this webinar on a risk matrix is that uh, once we've rated our risks, so say we've got a handful of, of 20 risks and we rate them all within our risk matrix, we can use the matrix to highlight where we need to focus. And we do this simply by colouring in. Um, as you can see, I have used three different colors, a red, an amber, and a green, to color in the risk matrix that we have in front of us now. But you can use whatever color scheme you would like. You can brand it within your own organization colors, or you can use a very similar RAG status to this. You don't need to color in all of those cells with the same color as I have done. Um, Instead, you should be coloring in those cells in alignment with your own organizational risk appetite and tolerance to those risks. Now, <clears throat> often, those risks that appear in the red that I've got here, if a risk is plotted there, the red is telling you that you need to do something about them. So if you have a very large appetite for risk, you might want to color in more of your cells within your risk, your risk matrix red 
However, if you have a low appetite for risk, you might want to color in fewer of them. Amber might mean that you want to consider doing something about the risk. And if you plot a risk in green, that might mean you want to leave it alone for the moment or it's fairly low priority and you might want to just monitor that risk. Um, there is lots more that we can talk about with regards to your risk appetite and tolerance and the color schemes within your risk matrix. And that is something that we touch on in more detail during the training course. If we move on to our final slide with regards to our risk ratings matrix, um, once people feel happy about it within your organization and they really understand it, it can be used as a really useful reporting tool. And quite a few organizations are now using a form of risk matrix to display their risks within their annual reports, for example. And this works really well as it very quickly displays a lot of information on one piece of paper and allows the reader to inform or focus their own decision making without having to read a lengthy risk report or go into depth on your risk register, for example. You can also display both positive and negative risks on the same matrix as we see here using different color schemes, um, such as red for the negative risks and green for your positive risks. Um, you can include things like arrows to show how risks are changing with time. There's lots of different tools that you can use to enhance um, this as a reporting tool. So, in summary, for a risk ratings matrix, please, please, please don't use a generic risk matrix. Don't copy and paste it from another organization. Rather, take the time to tailor your matrix to your organization as it will work so much better and it will actually be used by all the different people within your organization. Once you've created your risk matrix, don't be afraid to review it because as your organization evolves, your risk matrix may also need to evolve. The world doesn't stand still, um, and just because you got this right last year doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be right in 10 years' time. And finally, your risk matrix can be used as a prioritization and a decision-making tool, as well as a method of communication and behavior driver. But, as I've said before, more on that um, within the full training course, which we'd love to see you on. So, moving on to our final section um, of this webinar and moving into the last 10 minutes that we've got available, um, we're going to talk about my, my, well, my favorite tool um, that we're talking about today, which is the risk bow tie. Now, um, a risk bow tie can be either simple or complex, and there's some really good software out there that you can use to help you create a bow tie. However, personally, um, I like to construct them, construct them using post-it notes and a large area of wall or piece of paper. Um, I've been lucky enough to draw them in the sand on Brazilian mine sites um, to better understand why a piece of equipment is broken. Um, and I've also used slightly posher versions of them to explain the intricacies of things like HIV, TB in Southern Africa to the board of a FTSE 100 company. I cannot promote this tool enough. It is really a really brilliant facilitation tool. It's a good problem-solving tool, a decision-making tool, a communication tool, and also an investigation tool. And they're so simple. Anyone can learn how to use one and to develop an initial action plan to better manage their risks in 30 minutes or so. I should also mention quickly that the reason why they are called bow ties is simply because they look like a bow tie. Uh, believe it or not, that is a question I get asked a lot. So, okay, to construct a simple bow tie, you just need to follow five simple steps. And the first step is write your risk on a piece of paper and put it in the middle of your bow tie. It doesn't matter if you cannot quite articulate what your risk is at this stage, um, and this is often the case, just write something down as because when you progress through the methodology of doing the bow tie, your understanding of what the risk really is will become more clear. The second step is to list all of the causes of that risk, both direct and indirect, likely or unlikely, 
that you can think of and put them on the left-hand side of your bow tie, i.e. at the beginning of your timeline. So what are all the causes that might result in that risk occurring? The third step is to move across to the right-hand side of your bow tie and list all of the consequences. Again, these might be both direct and indirect, likely or unlikely. Um, you can use tools like the Institute of Risk Management wheel, for example, to make sure you're thinking about all those financial consequences, reputational consequences, legal consequences, etc. You can list them all here. The fourth step is to move back to the left-hand side of your bow tie, um, and therefore we're going pre-risk event on your timeline, um, and list all of the proactive or those preventative controls. Now, some of the controls that you list might be in place already and might be fully effective, which is fantastic. Um, others might not. They might be blue sky ideas, but just list them here because you can always scribble them out if you don't think that they are relevant. If your risk in question is negative, you can think of these controls as being barriers between the causes and the risk occurring. Whereas if your risk is positive, you might like to think of these controls as being enhancers to that risk occurring. The final stage is to move across to the right-hand side of your bow tie and list all of the reactive controls, i.e. the controls which, should the risk occur, will either reduce the full impact of the consequences if your risk is negative or increase the impact of the consequences if your risk is positive. Most of these controls are things that you need to plan and put in place in advance of that risk occurring, um, rather than things that you need to put in place after the risk occurs. You need to do that planning in advance. Um, and they include things like business continuity plans, insurance, etc. And there you have it, a really simple bow tie. Now, <clears throat> each of those five sections can be refined and revisited as much as you like. Um, but just remember that your first pass will typically take anywhere between half an hour and an hour, and it provides that initial skeleton which you can then build more detail on top of. There are lots of ways in which you can use your bow tie um, to make it a bit more complex and get it to feed into other tools um, within your risk management. Um, one of these is getting it to support your business case or feed information into your business case for why you might want to manage a risk. And this is really simple as it's constructed from all of those consequences that you listed, be they financial, safety, reputation, production, etc. orientated. Because when you're trying to sell the importance of managing your risk, this is where you get your opening arguments from, i.e., why should anyone care about this risk and therefore listen to you and give you the resources and the money that you might need to manage it. Another tool that you can use based off the, the foundations of a bow tie is root cause analysis. Now, root cause analysis is a, a very common um, investigation tool, um, a planning tool, actually. Um, and to support this, you can use all of those causes that you listed on the left-hand side of your bow tie, be they direct or indirect, and you can pull them out into the different strands of root cause analysis or fault tree analysis. The key to doing this really well is to find data to prove or disprove those causes rather than lie, relying on an individual's opinion for whether those causes might really be in place or not. Finally, your bow ties can be used to really hone in and select which controls you might want to put in place to better manage a risk. Um, and you can use them to ascertain what the effectiveness is of your suite of controls. You can do this by splitting out all of those causes and working out, do you have at least one control in place between that cause and that risk? If so, fantastic. If not, excellent, you have found a gap that you might need to focus in on. Secondly, you can go in and have a look at those individual controls and using internal and external data sets, you can assess the effectiveness of those controls in place, i.e., what is the quality of their design? 
Are they designed really well? Are they engineering controls? Or are they relying on a human being to abide by a rule um, or a procedure? And secondly, have you actually implemented them? Is that control just really well designed but not implemented with your organization? And as a result, the effectiveness would be zero. Or have you implemented it 100% and it's working really well? This sort of information is really useful for your internal assurance team. Um, and if you can provide it to them, it allows them to focus their resources um, and their ability to go in and have a real look at where those gaps are in those controls to ensure that you are managing your risks to the best of your ability. So that brings us to um, the end of our webinar. Um, so we've, we've been going for 60 minutes, and I think most of you are probably at the, at the end of your break, I suspect. Um, what we've got on this slide in front of you is a, a list of some of the upcoming courses that we've got within the Institute of Risk Management that uh, makes use of some of those tools that we've gone through today. Um, we also run a whole load of private or in-house training courses, and if you're interested in, in organizing one of those, please get in touch with us either at the Institute of Risk Management or contact me directly within, uh, within Satala. So as you can see there, our first course is around how to develop an effective risk register, and that's been run on Wednesday the 30th of September in London. Um, we've then got a, another session running on the 19th of November looking at bow ties and risk matrices. Um, and actually, I've just received a note now to say that we've got another one in the diary to look at high-quality risk assessments, which will be run on Thursday, the 8th of October. Now, these courses are all being run in London, um, but as I mentioned earlier, we do travel all over the world, and we're very happy to come and see you wherever you might be. Um, just before we go, we've got one final vote for you, which may or may not work. Um, which is along the lines of asking you, are you interested in either becoming a member of um, Institute of Risk Management? Are you interested in any more training courses or qualifications, etc.? And I've just been um, advised by my technical <laughs> guru here that that, that vote's not going to work for you. If you would like more information, please do get in contact with us, as there's a huge amount of free resources available um, to you. Um, I hope that you have found this webinar useful, um, and hopefully we've managed to increase the future impact of tools such as your risk register, your risk ratings matrix, and your risk bow ties. Thank you so much, and good luck with your risk management, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>